So we hope it's, it's enough. There are many more people we would have liked to, to invite for this panel as well. Um, but, um, um, but, um, but we're very happy to, for, to those of you who, um, and, and grateful to those of you who did uh, join us today, some of you with a fairly short uh, notice as well. Um, so just a few uh, comments about um, who we are as a global action. Uh, we're, uh, I think most of you have heard about us uh, before and some of you know us quite well. Uh, we're a solidarity organization and we work with partners globally to fight uh, global inequalities. And our roots are actually in the Danish uh, anti-apartheid uh, movement. Uh, and um, some of us are, belong to the South Africa group and we uh, have partnered with uh, Kasau, the, the farm workers union. Uh, um, and Denico is here to talk about uh, them today. Uh, and of course the old, um, uh, and working specifically with the wine farm, farm workers. Uh, we also work with uh, Trust for Community Outreach and Education in South Africa. Uh, Mersha, I think, just uh, uh, popped in briefly there. She is the, one of the directors uh, of that organization uh, and other organizations and so, social movements in, in Southern Africa. Um, of course, uh, a large part of the, um, the anti-apartheid uh, um, uh, campaign in Denmark uh, over almost 30 years and, uh, until uh, the end of apartheid was a consumer campaign, a huge consumer boycott uh, that took uh, a lot of work uh, and, uh, and a, a lot of people were involved in, in putting that together. It was the most comprehensive boycott in the world was the Danish one. Um, so it is always something that we come back to as an organization. That is where our, our roots are. Um, in, in the South Africa group in Global Action, we have uh, this autumn um, been working on a, on a campaign. Um, and it's again about a kind of a consumer campaign, but a consumer information campaign uh, that focuses on labeling. Uh, and if you see the beautiful background to Mikael or the Global Action logo, that is actually the logo from uh, our campaign. We had a little label made uh, and we've been telling the story of some of the uh, workers, farm workers who are organized uh, in Kasao and their experiences with being laborers in the South African wine industry today. Uh, and I can show you here if you can probably can't see it much. I hope you have seen it uh, in the supermarkets. Uh, we had a label made, uh, we placed it on uh, South African wines in the supermarkets, uh, and it is a little uh, information uh, pamphlet uh, to make Danish consumers uh, aware of, uh, of what we think they should know about labor conditions uh, in South Africa. Um, so that is kind of the background for this uh, webinar as well. We feel there's a lot of conversations that need to be had. We obviously know from Denico and our other partners that there's a lot of work to do um, for, uh, in terms of labor rights uh, in the Global South. Uh, and that is why we today try to bring together some people who have influence and to talk about what, what more we can do and who should be doing what in order to improve uh, workers' uh, conditions uh, in, in South Africa. Um, so as that is why we, we organized uh, this event. Uh, and we called it uh, what's in your wine glass, because that is what we think the consumers should also be focusing on. What is behind the label? What is it that they can't read on the label on the wine bottle? That when you, they ever they visit, uh, you know, the wine producers home pages or look at the wine bottles, it's always these beautiful landscapes um, and beautiful grapes and all that, but you don't see who actually produces, who actually does the hard work in the field. And it is that sort of disconnect uh, between what the consumer sees when he or she buys a bottle of wine, enjoys the wine, uh, and what actually is behind that, uh, that produce uh, that we would like uh, to address. Uh, and that's why we've uh, gathered this uh, amazing, absolutely awesome uh, panel today. Uh, and I will just very briefly just say uh, who they are and I will, I will um, mention your names in the in the sequence that we would uh, invite you to speak also in a minute. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Deniko Dube, uh, who is from uh, uh, the Farm Workers Union, uh, Kasao, Commercial Steve Doring Agricultural and Allied Workers Union. You can say Kasao for short. 
Uh, he's the Deputy Secretary General uh, of that trade union and has a long history with uh, farm workers uh, in South Africa uh, and will be able to tell us directly from the fields, directly from the negotiating tables of the trade union, uh, what is going on in, uh, that in, in the Western Cape uh, in South Africa. Uh, we also have uh, with us uh, Mina uh, Molgand Hansen, um, who is from uh, the Selling Group, which is the largest retail company uh, in Denmark. Um, and so she and she is responsible. Uh, she works in the department for responsible procurement, and we'll be able to talk about selling groups, uh, CSR policies, uh, how they uh, check uh, human rights, uh, and so on, uh, in in their procurement um, um, uh, policy for for selling group. Uh, again, a very large retailer in Denmark. Uh, it would be really really interesting to hear how you actually work. Uh, with, with the audits and, and all these things that we hear about maybe from, from Denico and the trade union. Um, then we have uh, with us Eddie Cottle, uh, with us now from, uh, from Cape Town. Uh, he's a labor scholar. He's been working on doing labor research for a very long time. And he's just, uh, I think, a few months ago completed a report on pesticides uh, in, in the South African agricultural industry, uh, particularly fruit and wine. So this again has to do with health and safety and due diligence uh, in, in the wine industry. Um, after that, we have another trade unionist, uh, again, to be able to talk about the role of trade unions in this, uh, again, focusing on international solidarity, just like uh, Denico from Casal, and, and to see what, what the trade union's role can be in, 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 um, in working with or, or putting pressure on uh, and retailers uh, in Denmark. Uh, finally, uh, we have with us uh, Tibis Pit Larsen, who is uh, the European coordinator of, uh, of the Clean Clothes campaign. Uh, and she's been following the process of, uh, of introducing um, mandatory due diligence legislation in, in the EU. Now that we have guidelines, there's no, there's no, really no real danger of not following these guidelines but that could change uh, next year or the year after. So CB will be able to tell us where that process is and, and maybe what, um, what that uh, um, uh, legislation could be used for. Um, so a large panel of, uh, of really, uh, really uh, exciting people, experts uh, in the field. Uh, and the way we've uh, tried to plan this is to have first every panelist just spend five, six minutes talking about how this topic, how they work with this topic in their area of work or in their organizations. Uh, and then we'll have a, a panel debate. I will I'll bring in some opening questions. Uh, and then finally, we'll have a, an open Q&A where everyone who's here is, is welcome to put questions, uh, type them in the chat or raise the hand or make some kind of noise to say that, uh, that you have a question. And I'll try to, to moderate that as well. Uh, but first of all, this uh, round of presentations from, from all the entire panel, all, all five uh, panelists. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, we'd like to start with, uh, with Denico. Uh, if you are ready, Denico, just to say or give your presentation on, on, on how your, your work relates to the topic of this, uh, this webinar today. Yeah, hi, thanks, and, and thanks everyone at Global Action and uh, comrades that have joined us in this webinar. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Yes, we, uh, I'm Denico, I'm the Deputy General Secretary and I'm situated in the Cape Town area, rural area called Robertson. Yeah, um, Kasau is mostly organizing farm workers in the most well, uh, vulnerable areas in the Western Cape. Uh, our intention is to go in national but yeah, this topic uh, connects to the reality that we face in our respective work that we've done with farm workers that we do every day. And that is basically to fight for the human rights and the dignity of farm workers. Because many reports have expressed the conditions of farm workers and how they live on, on these farming communities. But nothing has changed since these reports have coming out and we as Casau have taken this initiative with an alliance like TCOE and Global Action to 
see how we can strengthen or reach out to the consumers that is buying this wine because farm workers currently are not enjoying the fruits of what we call in South Africa democracy. They are not enjoying the human rights that we, we see in our beautiful constitution. They are still treated like slaves. They are still being seen as objects. And these people are mostly exposed to pesticides and they are informed that these uh, poison are not killing people. So we believe that we need to reach out to consumers across the world because we have tried locally to discuss with your Vita, with your CISA, and with other ethical bodies that are certifying these farms. So for them to sell the wine across the, the world. But these uh, certification bodies is not helping farm workers. They are helping the farm owners to selling their wines and their brand to putting that on the map uh, of the world without knowing that how they harm the, the dignity and the reality that farm workers are suffering every day. And we have engaged in uh, numerous times with these ethical bodies like your Vita and Caesar, and even your global cap, which are locally. <clears throat> now, the issue that we have with them is that the auditing process is excluding the workers and the trade unions out of uh, the auditing process. We, we are not included. Workers in most cases are not included in this auditing process. Even when we came to new farms where people joined the union, you will find that the houses is in worse condition. The working conditions is worse, but still these farmers have a certificate to sell their wines or their fruits across the world. And consumers across the world are buying this with, with the understanding that the living and working conditions of, of farm workers are very well uh, in South Africa. And we, are, as an organization, we are bringing out the truth to the world. So, and we are telling it like it is in the reality what we face. And just to, to share you the story that freedom of association in the South African wine farms is a dream in a pipeline for farm workers. There is no freedom of association for farm workers in South Africa. Whenever farm workers are joining a trade union, they are being victimized, intimidated, and they are looking for the ones that have bought the trade union onto the farm and once they got those uh, innocent people, they are being dismissed and illegal evicted from the farms. So freedom of association, which is a big global topic in terms of, of, of people exercising their rights to join trade union organizations of their choice. Farm workers don't enjoy such a right. In the midst of the 16 days of uh, crime against women and children, gender-based violence is the, is the worst issue that we are facing here in, in South Africa. But still farmers, even in, 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 in the 16 days, there are women that were dismissed because they joined the trade union of Kasau. And these women have worked for these farmers for more than 16 years, more than 20 years. They are merely targeted because they decided to exercise the right of freedom of association. But not even the local ethical bodies, we complain to them, we urge them to investigate these companies. They are blatantly ignoring us or saying that they will investigate, but we never receive outcome of any investigation report. And that is why we believe that we need to move closer to the consumers in, in other countries who's buying the South African wines and consumers must be informed. And when you buy this wine, you must know that where this wine is coming from. It's not coming from the brand that you buy, but it's coming from the hands of people who don't enjoy their human rights, who don't enjoy their dignity. 
And that is the question that consumers must start begin to ask when they're buying these wines. We have struggled with system bulagat. We have struggled with Vena Monopolet. There is some sort of a discussion between Vena Monopolet and Kasau, but system bulagat is not coming to the table to, so that we can put in some processes because we want to be part. First, we want to be part of the auditing process of any South African farm so that we can make sure that these auditors are doing their job as they are required and what the ethical standard is from these local uh, ethical bodies. That was one of our demands. We want to make sure that there is penalties for all these employers who are not allowing people or who are abusing the constitutional rights of workers for not allowing them to join a trade union of their choice. We want, we want some sort of action because we cannot, we cannot have, we have debated this issue of, we are in a dialogue with us, with these uh, farm owners who are exploiting and abusing the workers. And after the dialogue, nothing comes from it. These farm owners or people are still selling their products across the world, like nothing is happen, in, happening. And, the standards for workers are increasing and getting worse and worse and worse. That is what we want. We want some penalties for these farmers. We want, we want uh, a kind of legislation or policy that hold them accountable. If they're not going to comply to that, then there must be consequences. If they're not going to respect the, 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 the human rights of farm workers and uh, they treat them like human beings, then there must be consequences. That is, we were very clear in many meetings with Sister Bulagat, in many meetings with Vernon Monopoly and your Vita and your Global Gap and CISA around this issue. Because these farmers know they are not going to be penalized. They are not going, there is not going to be a sanction whenever they are violating any ethical standard, which are in any ethical body uh, of, of, of these organizations. And that is what we feel that it is high time that we bring this conscious of reality to the consumers and the consumers must hold these uh, system bulagas, vendor monopolies and all these uh, people that is buying, import the wine from South Africa to hold them accountable. What is the reality that we are faced because our people's dignity are being taken away. Children who is getting 18 years are being told they must move away from the farm where they have no alternative accommodation. Yalt and safety is only on a piece of paper, but it's not in reality. <clears throat> and many people have died because of this uh, pesticide that the farmers are forcing workers to work in. Even women are forced to work where, where the tractors is spraying these pesticides. And when we report these things to the VITAS and to the CISAS and to the Department of Labor, nothing comes from these investigations. So the only thing that we can do now is to strengthen our, our alliances with the consumers and the organizations across the world so that we can hold both the farm owners, both uh, the, uh, the importers and the exporters accountable for this harsh conditions that farm workers are living in, in South Africa. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deneko. Um, I think we are, you, you have uh, addressed everyone on the panel, will have something uh, to respond to that, I'm sure. Um, I would like to ask uh, uh, Mina Molgan Hansen from uh, Selling Group uh, to come in and give, uh, give her presentation. I'm sure you have a, a, a lot more now to comment on after, after Deneko's uh, presentation, but again, we also have more time to discuss afterwards. Um, uh, Mina? Yes. First of all, thank you so much for, for inviting us to be a part of this uh, debate and, and be a part of this panel. It's a, a discussion we're very happy to be a part of and also provide our um, an overview of how we work with uh, um, due diligence and, and workers' rights and, uh, and ethical trade in general and, and specifically within wine. 
Um, you already mentioned that uh, we are the biggest retailer in Denmark. Uh, we are also present in Poland and, and Germany, and we have a very wider uh, variety of, um, of uh, stores and services that we provide. Um, we, uh, um, I, I am responsible for, uh, for responsible procurement of our, our food uh, products, and that also includes wine um, uh, placed in the group quality department um, across all of our formats and all of the uh, countries that we operate in. Um, in regards to how we work with CSR, um, we um, a re what we call responsible products, which is where um, diligence is uh, very much the backbone of our work with CSR. Uh, that is responsible products and responsible people, uh, which is um, which is an area that uh, that we focus a lot on and uh, that we uh, always want to ensure uh, that there are that these uh, rights and uh, proper working conditions are met. And then we have some key um, priority areas on top of that, uh, like climate, for example, and health where we then have focused on some more specific um, areas like uh, our plastic principles uh, or climate labeling, for example. Um, in regards to responsible products, um, we are actually longstanding members of the Sustainable or Ethical Trade Organization, Amphori, and we have been applying their code of conduct as our supplier code of conduct since uh, 2006. And uh, uh, since 2015, we also have a, a much more systematic focus on, on uh, uh, responsible procurement, where we actually have a, a set policy that is integrated into all of our uh, supplier con uh, contracts. Um, we have started uh, basically mapping all of our uh, supply chains with starting with our own products and going firstly back to uh, the manufacturer of the final product. Um, we've been working with this very uh, intensely for the past five years now and, uh, and are now in a place where we can in uh, product category by product category start looking further uh, and going all the way to the farm level. Um, and, um, and we have, uh, of course, had a requirement of, uh, of suppliers from high-risk countries, which South Africa also is, uh, according to Amphori, and therefore according to us, to present a valid social audit so that we can uh, see that, uh, that the principles in the code of conducts are actually also met. Um, so in that regard, a very much uh, a classical uh, social compliance focus that, uh, that we have been working with. Uh, for the past uh, several years now, um, we have been working in a specific system where we gather data from all of our vendors around uh, production facilities. And specifically for wine, we actually uh, have for many years now had a requirement that we need to know uh, um, the producer all the way back to the vineyard. Um, so we need the full supply chain to be mapped. Um, and uh, since South Africa is a high risk country, we of course also need to see um, documentation on a social audit. Um, we're working very closely together with Amphori, who has um, had a lot of focus on wine. Uh, they have a sustainable wine program. Uh, which uh, unfortunately at the moment is uh, set a little bit on hold, um, but it's a very, very good uh, networking opportunity for us to work together with the other um, Nordic alcohol monopolies, for example, but also other retailers and share experiences, because our main challenge very often is that we're far removed from the farm. We want to have all the information um, and often uh, the best way for us to go about it is actually through uh, audits and through gathering uh, data uh, because um, 
because we are so far removed and, and because we have all the products uh, under the sun that we, we have to take care of. So we can't uh, escape uh, a systematic focus. Um, a, an important thing to mention is that we work with continuous improvement um, in preparation for, for uh, presenting our work to you. Uh, I saw that you had also asked what are the criteria that go into selecting different products and selecting different uh, vendors. And uh, it's really willingness to be uh, audited if that is needed and willingness to work with sustainability. We work very, very uh, hard with our vendors uh, for wine. It's very often agents um, that or importers of wine so that they get up to date on what are the issues because uh, technically and, and uh, commercially they are the experts uh, so that, that we have the sustainability and due diligence uh, focus uh, all the way through and uh, we communicate all the way through uh, within our uh, supply chains. So we don't ever really uh, exclude any producers uh, or any vendors uh, just like that. Um, we always take a dialogue. We always see whether if there is uh, no audits or if there, the, our requirements are not met from the bat, can they be met? When can they be met? Um, so we look for willingness to work with things. We also actually read audit reports um, and look for uh, hotspots and look for uh, red flags uh, in regards to, to serious issues. Uh, that is where our source of information on top of networking with other organizations. So, uh, so when, when we hear that there are things uh, that we're not getting from audit reports, we really, really see that this panel and this, these sorts of discussions and networking opportunities are extremely valuable for us because uh, we're only as smart as the information that we get. Um, but uh, another part of continuous improvement is also that we expect uh, producers to, to work on these issues and we're there to uh, support uh, in any way we can. Uh, again, through Amphori, we can, uh, we can uh, provide uh, training workshops. Uh, Amphori also has a lot of uh, contacts in South Africa uh, and uh, our uh, vendor because we need to mention that South Africa isn't our biggest uh, sourcing country when it comes to wine, but it is big for us because it is high risk and it is big for us because we have a lot of uh, smaller producers. Um, yes, I think I have gone through uh, most. Feel free to ask me questions later on if I've forgotten something. I hope you've gotten an overview. Thanks a lot, Mina, that, that's great. Uh, I'm sure we'll have lots more uh, questions uh, later, but let's uh, get get through a bit, a bit more input from the other panelists as well. Uh, next up is is um, is Eddie Eddie Cottle from uh, from Cape Town, uh, our uh, labor researcher. Um, Eddie, are you are you on? Um, yeah, uh, it's great to be here, and thank you very much for the invitation and organizing this event. I think it's just wonderful. Uh, to get kind of um, some kind of alliances across the globe. And in particular, since we are facing, I think, a highly toxic future here in South Africa. Um, as you might know, um, despite the high risk, South Africa is really has a huge growth in terms of the wine industry. It's grown by 500% um, since uh, 1996. Uh, it employs about over 300,000 workers in the value chain. Um, the EU accounts for about 74% of um, all the sales um, of South African exports in terms of, of wine. But here's the problem um, that's developed. Um, in order for South Africa to sustain the growth that it has achieved, it has simultaneously had to buy into um, the global pesticide market um, and um, take over some of those poisonous pesticides from Europe and extend um, the amount of pesticides or active ingredients that's used within South Africa. 
and that's I think is part of the hypocrisy um, of the whole issue around um, pesticides and the so-called um, developing world. So currently we have about 9,000 pesticide products registered in South Africa um, compared to 3,000 we had in 2010. So you can see that's a massive increase in the number of pesticide products um, registered in South Africa. And South Africa currently has uh, probably the fastest growing market uh, in terms of, um, of pesticides. Um, so it grew about 5% in 2018, which is about twice that of the global average um, in terms of, of growth in pesticides, in terms of the market and expansion of that market. And of course, all the global players are in South Africa. Uh, they have production houses, they manufacture some of those, of those active ingredients, and some of them come directly from Europe, even though they are banned for use within agriculture uh, within um, Europe. And just to give you a kind of sense of what is happening with, with, I think, this toxic future, is that a recent report, which is a 2019 report on farming in the Western Cape, across three kind of different farming areas, and one of them was the Hex River Valley, which is the Table Grapes Valley. Um, and these researchers looked at the number of pesticides different farms used. Um, sorry, this was 38 farms. And they found that on 38 farms, 96 different pesticide products were being used. Uh, so that's fungicides, insecticides, and herbicides. Um, so what you're really having is in order to kind of, well, I think from the farming side is to kind of have high yields uh, and, and crop protection in their own terms uh, is to use quite multiple types of, of pesticides, herbicides and insecticides with on one farm or within, within that farm. Um, and of course it's dangerous within a valley itself if different farms, adjacent farms, are using also different pesticide products. And you have, of course, migration of those pesticide products within the air and so on in circulation onto other farms. And so I think with this massive growth and the consolidation of monopolies uh, and centralization um, of uh, um, commercial farming in South Africa, um, you are having this massive pesticide treadmill um, taking place. So the pesticides that were over, I think the recommended kind of um, environmental quality st standards, I think wine grapes came third in terms of, of the uh, scale in which there was kind of exceedances of um, environmental quality um, standards in the areas. But to give you maybe a better picture, I don't know if you can see this, I guess you can't, right? <laughs> um, but we have about, in terms of the study that we did for uh, TCOE, uh, we looked at really 15 banned active ingredients. And we found that all of these 15 banned ingredients, active ingredients, there were about 201 products, pesticides, from just 15 active in ingredients, uh, not to mention glyphosate. And uh, almost, almost all of these were banned in the EU. However, they are not banned in terms of the export of fresh produce or wine from South Africa back to the EU. As long as they retain the export quality standard uh, that I think my, uh, my comrades earlier spoke about. So that I think is, is the whole kind of hypocrisy. So on the one hand, we're having the poisoning of our uh, countryside, the exposure of, of farm workers on a daily basis. And in fact, the interesting phenomenon recently is that even now affluent white suburbs who are where they live adjacent to the farms or on farms are also now being directly affected. And so you also have affluent people having lawsuits against farmers commercial farmers currently um, in South Africa. But of course, as my colleague from 
the Saudis said that workers don't have the same power as an elite uh, with any kind of geographic um, environment that, that they, they live in. So just to give you a sense of, of what happens on farms, and I think Women on Farms did a very interesting study, which was also a recent study on women on farms, and in particular in the wine uh, industry. And this study was on 343 women. And they found out that 63% of the women did not have access to a toilet, and 50% had no access to washing facilities in a vineyard. Now, if you read any label um, from a pesticide or active ingredient or product, one of the most essential things to have at hand is water. <laughs> Um, because what is essential to, to cleaning, to the cleaning process, of course, the problem with farming is that unlike other industries we have manufacturing and so on, is that there is no specialized cleaning facility, which is actually what is required to get rid of pesticides. And what that happens is you have a high risk of um, transportation of the, the pesticides from the farm worker into the homes of farm workers because they are on the clothing and the farm worker has to take the clothing home um, as well. It's on the hair, it's all over. Um, about 65% of the women did not receive protective clothing might work because the application of pesticides is seen as a male job. Uh, female workers aren't really seen as important in terms of being looked after. It's mainly, mainly the men, uh, if they're lucky, that are looked after in terms of adequate protection. Uh, and the interesting thing here, and I think it's for my colleagues as well, and for Mina to take note of when they're conducting their audits, I think this is very, very important. 48% of women on export producing farms did not receive protected clothing, okay? And these are, of course, these expert farms are, of course, the accredited farms and those farms which are audited. So I think that there's a lot of work to be looked at in terms of the auditing process that is happening. And clearly, it's not a democratic process. You know, it's kind of high-ended consultants who are with the farmers and they may, of course, meet the, the farmers. Okay, and I think the most shocking thing of all was about 40% of women come into contact with pesticides within the first hour of its application. So there's serious dangers. And now the concern is that, or at least we have, is that because you're having this growing, growing industry on pesticides, it's becoming more complicated every year. Um, it means that the state must set aside more money to get scientists on this and to get managers on this and vis-a-vis um, -vis other kinds of expenses that is happening. So what this African government does at the moment, it only tests certain um, products for export. There is no systematic database at all for export products, import products um, that is produced on an annual basis. Sorry, there is no systematic collection of data on the deaths due to pesticide poisonings or chronic illnesses related to this. So we actually don't know the actual extent of the problem in terms of farm workers' health um, in South Africa. We can see it, we can hear about it. Um, and so I think that is of course an, an issue of major, major concern. And clearly what is happening is there's no tax or recourse even for the state. <laughs> Um, to say, well, we're going to have to impose a tax uh, or even say to the EU, look, you are part and parcel of this issue of the trade and there has to be some kind of work on this as well. Um, so in terms of the wine industry, in terms of the current studies, which we found that there were 87 pesticide products that went into producing the wine that is exported. Uh, um, to back to the, the EU and so on. Um, but 
According to the EU, when they do check South African products, they say, well, in fact, when they do do um, audits of the products they receive, they say that there is a high quality standard and in keeping with the EU regulations. So I think there's a big problem even from your side in terms of what is being accepted by the authorities within the EU, who themselves, of course, being lobbied um, by these uh, monopolies in the pesticide um, industry. Um, and I think that um, the big issue for, for, I think, for a common agenda is possibly to get together to, to ban, to ensure that there's a ban on glyphosate, uh, you know, the active ingredient, which is used across the board for almost every single fresh produce that is produced across the globe, in fact, and across the world and in South Africa. In fact, the, your wine <laughs> has that in it as well. Um, so of course there is the big attempt to ban this globally. I know Denmark has done something already on this in terms of limiting post implementation of herbicides. Um, but the point really is that 79 agricultural products in South Africa have glyphosate contained in it. And that's, that's very used. And it's even used for domestic purposes and it's very popular. Roundup, of course, is, is very, very popular. Um, our, the South African Cancer Association has supported um, the World Agency on Cancer Research, despite the kind of differences that have evolved in the global um, bodies. I think they've taken a very progressive step but they've kind of limited their position on the question. They haven't called for an outright ban. They've called for a limitation, I think, maybe of where you can apply uh, the active ingredient and, and those kinds of things. So I think it, it, is, it is a huge problem because crop life South Africa, which is part of the global conglomerate of pesticide producers, um, have told the government that there will be a losses of jobs and billions would be lost within the SAC industry, a kind, the, kind, the kind of normal kind of arguments that they use. The South African government in turn has bought the argument of the pesticide companies and said that glyphosate poses a minimal risk to users. Um, so I think that's where we're at in South Africa. It's a big fight, but I think that maybe there could be a common agenda at least to have an effective agenda is to highlight maybe one or a few of these kinds of, of active ingredients to call for a ban. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eddie. That was a, a good five minutes, I think. But uh, oh, sorry. Super interesting. I'm, I'm thought I'm going to get a board saying you have five minutes left. <laughs> um, and uh, everyone's requesting your report, so let me just ask you right away: Is it published, or is it? Can we share it, or what is the situation with it? While we are sorry, now you're muted, uh, Eddie. Um, it will be finalized at least by Monday. Okay, so then we will share with uh, everyone who, who would like a copy. I can see several that have asked for, for the copy. Yeah. Uh, so, so put your email uh, in the chat if, we don't, if you don't think we have it, otherwise we will, um, we will look at the chat and send it uh, to you or forward it to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, yeah. thanks Eddie. Uh, moving swiftly along, uh, is uh, next in line is uh, Jesper Nielsen from, uh, from uh, 3F. Um, Jesper, are you, are you there? From the yes, I am. <laughs> I just need to put on the yep, yes. camera. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, and, and thank you so much for the presentations. I think it's really uh, uh, highly interesting. And I would say con it confirms some of our uh, thoughts and our observations uh, with this about uh, um, uh, how, to, how, to, how to improve uh, the respect for labor rights and how to um, uh, improve uh, human well-being across the, the value chains. I've, I know it's very complicated because we've been working with it for quite a number of years 
And as you may know, 3F is uh, the largest Danish trade union federation with around 270,000 uh, workers as members in all uh, or in most sectors, inclu including agriculture. And we've been working for more than 30 years in third world countries uh, to uh, improve the respect for workers' rights and help unions organize uh, workers. Our, our firm belief is that um, the strength to change things comes uh, uh, bottom up. Uh, if, if workers are not organized, we can do all we want to do in uh, rich countries, uh, put pressure on supermarkets and everything. It, it, it doesn't really work if it's not paving the way for, for workers to organize and to uh, fight for decent working conditions uh, on the ground. We also believe firmly that workers should have influence in their workplace through collective bargaining. Collective bargaining agreements is a criteria when we uh, 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 try to develop our own procurement policy as, as a federation. We, ha we have um, become members some years back of uh, the Danish Ethical Training Initi Trading Initiative, where we also meet the supermarkets, where we also meet the NGOs, where we meet other trade unions and a number of companies. Um, uh, it, this is uh, a place where we have a, this very interesting discussion. I agree with my colleague from South Africa that very often we see audits and certificates being made for the benefit of companies without consulting the workers' representatives. We think uh, audits have a, a systematic bias because workers are not really heard. It, you can say that uh, they always interview a number of workers, but workers are not free to express their opinion about what goes on. Our Danish experience tells us that only if you have elected worker representatives protected against firing and other reprisals, you can have a sort of a free free speech of the workers you can have the you can have the workers voice without that with, when there's no representation not a union not a, a collective bargaining agreement we don't see uh, the truth coming out through the audit reports and i've read th uh, quite a number of them because when we try to buy products as union we ask our suppliers for these uh, amphorae reports and other reports i think they're useful that uh, there are elements in them that are useful, but we will not give the give the we will not get get the full truth without, as we do it, contacting unions, organized workers on the ground and get their version of 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 the story. So I would, um, uh, yeah. At the same time, we are organized internationally. Uh, I think we are sister organizations. Uh, um, because IUF is a, a global union uh, to which I think we are both affiliates. Uh, uh, Denico, uh, they have done a lot of work also on pesticides, uh, also on freedom of associations, uh, association in the agricultural sector, and we have been supporting that for for a number of years. We are in. We are also working in South Africa. We have a regional office there. But still, we are not working in, in the old days. Years back, we worked in the agricultural sector. But, but uh, nowadays, we only work in construction and are trying to um, get into industry. But it is interesting to know about uh, the agricultural sector as well. And of course, you will be welcome to um, visit our people in South Africa and uh, get their advice from, from a Danish union. Um, I would say that uh, when, 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 we, when I'm told that uh, health and safety is only on paper and I hear all this about pesticides, these are also some of the things we've been working quite a lot with, not only in Southern Africa, but also in, especially in Latin America. Uh, and I was told when I started back in 99 that uh, workers would never use trade union 
tools like strikes to have a health and safe, healthy and safe um, work environment. But I found out that uh, it, that's not the truth. Uh, when workers use the trade union strength, they can improve their uh, health and safety. So one of the conclusions is that the, the, the most fundamental right for this to improve is the freedom of association and the right to collective bargaining. But another one, which is maybe not mentioned so often, is the right to know. The workers right to know what they're working with, the workers right to know uh, how it can harm their health, the workers right to know how they can be uh, safe and healthy, how they can protect their own health, and the right to participate in the um, organizing of a healthy working environment. That is a fundamental human right, and I think uh, very often you, uh, uh, you don't hear so much about it. Um, I think this is the main thing I would say. We, we, we have the experience uh, trying to buy some, I know it's low quantities, especially of wine. We only use that for presents in, <laughs> in 3F. We have a high consumption of coffee, so we made our way into the coffee sector and made agreements not only with the supplier, but also with the coffee cooperative from where we source our coffee to make sure that unions have free access, workers are fully informed about their rights and so on and so forth. We would like to have that kind of agreement on every product we, we consume as a trade union federation, but it's not possible. It's not been possible in um, merchandise like textiles and I think with the small quantities of wine we, we use, I don't think we will have much uh, leverage in that, but we would be very interested in discussing with, uh, with the Danish uh, wine importers and, 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 uh, and supermarkets. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Jesper. I think you've also now uh, drawn up some uh, some uh, lines of debate and disagreement for, for afterwards, I think. Who has the influence? Uh, Denico talked about uh, going to the consumers. Uh, we've talked about the trade unions, workers' organization. Uh, and now we're going to hear a, a, of another mechanism or level, if you like, from, uh, from Tibi Larsen, who's with us from uh, Brussels, uh, to talk about uh, the due diligence uh, process uh, the legislation process in the EU at the moment. Uh, Tibe, are you there? Yes, uh, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to, to this event. Um, so I come from uh, the organization network, a Clean Clothes Campaign. And just to, to give a little bit of context uh, on that, it's a global network uh, with more than 200 uh, organizations, human rights, uh, unions, um, organizations uh, with the specific focus on working uh, with garment workers and improving the conditions uh, for garment workers. Uh, so it's a, it's a slightly different field from wine production, but uh, also with what is being said from other um, presenters tonight, uh, it's, it's clear that it's a, there is a lot of links uh, between the human rights violations that are experienced by workers in wine production and workers in garment production. Um, so I think uh, while I'm really not uh, very knowledgeable on, on what wine uh, workers ex experience, um, I think that we can definitely share some experiences here in any case. Um, yeah, so I was asked to, to say uh, something specifically on the, the process uh, for an EU legislation, which is uh, in the process at the moment. Um, so the, the Clean Clothes Campaign, CCC, it's a, it's a, a core part of the, our priorities uh, to work for and demand um, legislation, regulation and binding mechanisms on uh, the area. Uh, so of course we link it to garment workers, but we are calling for due diligence legislations on human rights to actually have a, the, the human rights um, implemented and be enforceable by binding agreements and legislation. So to hold uh, companies accountable for the violations that happen in their supply chains. Um, 
Yeah, to say a bit of that, at the moment we have uh, the UN guiding principles, we have the OECD guidelines, we have ILO conventions, etc. Um, but the problem is that these, while they are generally said to be international law, there are no mechanisms to enforce these. So it's, it's really left as a voluntary agreement, voluntary, voluntary um, practices of companies. And as has been mentioned uh, with the audits, uh, with CSR uh, policies, uh, codes of conduct, etc., these are generally proven to, to fail. Um, this is what we see and what we have seen in the past, that it's, it's simply not good enough to actually protect the people and for that matter, the environment as well. Um, so while under the UN guiding principles on, on business and human rights, uh, it states that uh, there is a state and a corporate duty to protect and respect uh, these rights. Uh, and also that the corporate duty exists independently of state's ability uh, uh, and or willingness to fulfill their own human rights obligations. Um, and it, it exists also over and above compliance with national laws and regulations on respecting human rights. Um, and uh, human rights uh, due diligence, due diligence in, in general, it means that companies must assess their supply chain and identify, stop, prevent, uh, or mitigate any human rights uh, risks or violations and remediate any remaining harm and monitor and report on the progress here. Um, so this is, this is what a due diligence uh, will, uh, or what it actually entails uh, for corporations. Um, so of course we want to hold companies accountable um, to actually do their due diligence. Uh, there are several uh, nation states uh, in the process of working on these. Um, we also have the concepts of national action plans. Uh, we have the OECD uh, national contact points. However, um, uh, this, uh, I, I think we need to play in several fields. This is a clean clothes campaigns a perspective that uh, we want to we want to um, to work on having binding mechanisms uh, where uh, and and in in what way this is possible. Uh, and we're very happy when uh, the EU Commission, uh, led by uh, the DT Justice and Commissioner Reinders announced in the spring that they want to propose, uh, uh, make a proposal on a, a, a due diligence legislation on human rights and environmental uh, impacts in 2021. So um, right now we have a, a process of consultations going uh, at the EU level. It started on the 26th of uh, October and it will go until the 8th of February. Um, so this is asking uh, civil society, asking uh, uh, organizations, citizens, et cetera, to participate in the consultation and, and, and give a submission, which can happen in the form of, a, for instance, a policy paper. It can happen in a, via this a submission form, like a questionnaire. Um, so uh, from CCC uh, Clean Clothes Campaign, we are working on a policy paper to submit to this consultation and planning to participate. Um, in addition to this, uh, we are also collaborating with other organizations. Uh, and I, I think it, it might be relevant to share with you all. I think you might find it interesting. It was just a launch today, um, a, a website that enables a, regular people, regular citizens in the EU to participate. Uh, I can't post in the chat, it seems. Um, otherwise, if it doesn't, if I don't succeed in posting here, yep, there it comes. So this is a website for, for EU citizens uh, to participate, to make it easy for regular people who are not organized in whatever way here to, to actually also um, yeah, participate in the consultation and, and a, have a voice a, in asking for a strong law on human rights and environmental due diligence that 
because uh, as I mentioned, it, it's in the process of being made now. So what, what a legislation actually looks like, we, we, don't, we won't know yet. Um, so this is one avenue of engagement and for non-EU uh, organizations in the global south, um, Anti-Slavery International, Global Witness and a Clean Clothes Campaign have been working on a, a way to also, or like a similar kind of take action opportunity to easily uh, participate in the consultation. This is not up yet, but I will definitely share it with Global Action so um so you can also share with your network yeah so i think that this is definitely a, it's a great opportunity for us all to actually participate and and ask for strong uh, eu legislation on this and if i should say a little bit about what it might mean or what we hope that this will uh, enable um it's a, to have the obligation there to do human rights and environmental due diligence uh, which is now basically on a voluntary basis because we don't have any mechanisms to hold uh, companies accountable for this process. Um, and that this due diligence, it, it really goes uh, through the supply chain. Uh, this would also entail stakeholder consultations, e.g. Uh, for instance, with the uh, trade unions, such as uh, Casau, uh, and um, it will uh, it will entail uh, yeah like actually thorough consultation of the people uh, affected um, by it. Uh, it should hold uh, companies liable. So we want the corporate accountability to hold companies liable to what happens in their supply chain, including subsidiaries and suppliers, so that it's not just to push the responsibility down the chain, but it actually includes a uh, first, second, third, and so on tier suppliers. Uh, and then in the terms of, uh, of what happens when there is a violation, that, that the company can be uh, prosecuted, can be sued basically, um, and can be sanctioned accordingly. Um, so this would, for instance, mean that, that uh, people affected uh, uh, in one part of the world can go to, or in an EU country, for instance, a, for instance, a selling <laughs> to put you on the, a, on the stands, Mina, um, that if there is a violation in selling's uh, supply chain, then uh, Casal could uh, go through a, a Danish court to hold a uh, selling accountable for this violation. So this is um, the, the, this whole accountability question and, and, and how strong and how far it goes do down uh, the supply chain is an important part of this. Um, and, and it really is also because we see that these voluntary mechanisms and audits and uh, that it's, uh, it's, it's simply not enough to ensure that human rights violations uh, don't occur in, in the supply chains of companies in general, com when companies work like this, um, um, yeah, cross country globally. Yeah. I think this is, um, this is what I wanna say for now on this. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Tifa. And thanks for also uh, starting the, the discussion in a way with uh, suggesting uh, topics for panelists to, to have. Um, we've also in the, in the group from Global Action uh, thought of a, of a few questions for the panel first. Uh, as I said before, we open the floor to everyone who's uh, in, in the Zoom meeting today. Uh, and the first uh, question is, is, is probably uh, is quite broad, but it comes back to again to the consumer and to the, I guess, the description of this event as well, about that uh, disconnect between consumer and, and the actual labor process that has gone into the, the product uh, that, that one buys. And if, if this is uh, a problem, I think uh, Jesper, uh, you mentioned that workers have a right to know uh, that this is very important. And of course, we're doing an information campaign. You could say, well, the consumer has a right to know, but what does a consumer have a right to know when you buy a, a project? Uh, we know very little of the labor conditions that Denico has described when we buy a bottle of wine in Denmark. 
we know very little as consumers about this labor process. Is this a problem, do you think? And what could we or anyone do about it if you think it, it's a problem? Uh, and maybe, um, uh, maybe, maybe uh, yes, but you would, you would go first to, to talk about this uh, right to know. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, I, I agree that uh, we all have a right to know, but it, I was asked once if, uh, from the Agricultural uh, Workers Union's chairman uh, from one of the Latin American countries, if I thought we could ever have a label declaring the amount of suffering that has gone into an agricultural product. And I think that is impossible. We cannot do that. Only <laughs> we, we can do many things, but not that. I would say that uh, for us as a trade union, it's very relevant to say that the workers we have in the value chain should have an, a specific right to know about the uh, earlier uh, stages, the er earlier links in the chain. So, um, 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 a um, I, I know one of my one of our members is at the this, the selling group owns Neto and there's a, a the the central warehouse uh, there's a very active uh, uh, woman who has asked us several times about the fruit that comes into the uh, into the warehouse and I think that that kind of to to feel solidarity in the in the uh, in the chain and to take responsibility in the chain and say that okay. We are importing this and that, but we know that there is a problem here. So could could you, as as the buyers from the supermarket chain, could you could you do something about it? I know that Selling Group has done something about it in certain. Uh, when we have the dialogue, they are actually uh, taking some initiatives uh, towards the suppliers. So it's not it's not impossible. But I would like to develop that uh, even further and say that all workers, the transport workers, the warehouse workers, all the workers in, along the chain. And you know, even uh, as the workers, for instance, when we talk about um, garment, uh, fashion, the, the workers who are frontline sell uh, sellers <laughs> of, the, um, of, of the fashion, uh, they should know about the uh, working conditions in the value chain. But it's very, very difficult. And there are so many details and there are so many suppliers and even if you talk about all the wines you can find in Danish supermarkets, it would be quite complicated. It is too complicated for a con consumer, in my opinion. Uh, you, can, uh, you, you can have certain standards and there should be a high level of control with those standards. If you, for instance, declare that your wine is organic to get rid of those pesticides, the 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 consumer should be confident should be it should be possible to trust the label and say that it is organic it, there, there there is no pesticides in the production of this wine but but, uh, but but apart from that i don't think that you can put anything into the product declarations and labeling of the products i i do not think that i think we have a responsibility in the value chains uh, we as unions should work closely together with the uh, powerful buyers, like in Sweden and German uh, and, and Norway, the, the monopolies, also in Denmark, the, the biggest uh, supermarkets and, and wine importers. But, but I don't think the consumer can ever have enough detailed information to solve specific problems in, in the value chains. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Anyone else from the panel who wants to uh, come in with some input on this uh, issue more or more broadly about the consumer role, maybe? Um, I just wanted to say that I fully agree with the yes, but it is very difficult uh, for the consumer to even know what to ask. It's easier for them when it's product and, and it's about the product, but as we've all uh, said before, audits are a snapshot. There's no social, well, there are some social certificates, but, but it doesn't really say much. It says something about the day, the day when the uh, uh, producer was audited. And I don't think consumers are really 
well, they are, we are experiencing that they are more and more thinking about wh what are the working conditions. And, and we welcome, of course, all of these questions. It, it shows us that what we do, that it's uh, relevant and that we should be doing more and more of it. Um, but, uh, but it's very difficult to grasp. That's, that's our experience. It's difficult to grasp when it's not a, a product and it's people that are working with it. And people change suppliers change, there's an immense amount of complexity uh, that goes into it. Sometimes it, we don't even know who the actual raw material producer is. Um, but we want to, of course, know. It's, um, and we also are very happy for, uh, for any sort of uh, um, uh, laws and, and regulations that come and, and sort of level out the playing field and make it uh, make some information more uh, attainable, hopefully, uh, and not just something that we go after uh, in, in one way and, and the uh, monopolies in Norway go after in a different way, but that we all go after the same information and we all go after the same uh, requirements. And finally, also the part where workers need to know, that is also very, very true, because often audits come in uh, very late in a sense, um, um, they assess a situation, but uh, they're not able to capture when workers actually don't know that they, their rights are not being met, for example, or that they should have access to uh, some sort of uh, um, information. Mm -hmm. So um, just wanted to say, I fully agree <laughs> with the points mentioned. Yeah, I, I mean, I've sometimes myself tried to write to uh, companies and producers and said, please, uh, can you share with me the audit reports for this uh, product? And then they'll go back and forth and say, no, but we signed this certification or this, so we signed CEDEX or this, that and the other. And then said, but I would like to see the actual report that was done. And they said, no, but surely, you, you know, there's competitive reasons that we can't share that. Of course, you will understand. And I'm like, no, I, as a consumer would like more transparency. I agree, it is super complex uh, and all that. But then again, if I ask for the report, why shouldn't I have it? And that's where as a consumer, I think maybe, you know, there's all, there are more levels to it uh, than this. There's also something where I guess um, it, it also differs. Uh, I, I will assume that the state monopolies, uh, Systembolag, Vino Monopolet and uh, Alco have different set of regulations that they operate under than compared to you. Uh, I don't know if there's something there that is, is, is very different uh, for, because for example, I've seen Systembolag at some of their audits, for example, uh, it seemed a bit easier to access. So I don't know if, if I wrote to you, would you share the latest audit reports from, uh, from the Western Cape from the wine farms? Good question. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, one of the problems uh, that we face is that because, as I mentioned before, we're so far removed, we also need to make sure that the information is actually uh, valid and that is still a challenge for us. Um, so, uh, and of course, uh, we, we share the Emporia, that's why we go into the same, uh, or why we like audit uh, formats as, as a, a buyer organization or retailer or a producer, because it already reduces some of this duplication and sets a, a, a similar standard in a sense. So I'm sure Wien Monopole Wien and Sustenpole uh, Legal also have uh, many BSEI audits that we share probably. But uh, I think for, for our side, the big challenge is that uh, can we ever really ensure that when we're talking about a grower that uh, sells into a seller that uh, then sells to our supplier, then that might even go through a trader that it is the correct information we're actually giving. Um, so, so there are some risks there. And that's why I think we, we prefer to make sure ourselves, we have people like me that ensure that uh, the information is there. And in the future, there might even be um, a more uh, legal means to, to give further verification uh, to ensure that, that there actually is um, documentation and, um, and we're working on the issues. Right. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, Deniko, I think you raised the hand. 
Yeah, hi, thanks. Thanks for all the panelists that's given an input. It's very thoughtful and helpful. Uh, yeah, I just want to touch on what Jasper have said in terms of the right to know. And uh, for the farm workers or the workers on the ground level, they are not knowing anything about what the audits is, when it's coming, or who is going to do the audits. We were informed, I think, in 2016 that the monopolies are appointing independent auditors from, for example, the Western Cape to audit these farms. The other thing that we picked up is that, for example, Vita is using the very same labor consultants which are working for the farm owners of farms to doing uh, VITA audits or to giving workers information around VITA and they are withholding some of the ethical things that stands in, 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 the, in the VITA ethical, ethical codes. The other problem that we picked up <clears throat> and which are huge challenge is that it's only the, the owners that is informed, pre-informed about any order that is coming to the company. And once they are informed, they are going around to workers, forcing workers to sign documents so that they can prepare themselves, going to houses of farm workers, cleaning up the houses. In some instances, farmers are taking their own a kitchen where to the farm workers houses so that it can look beautiful for the auditors so that auditors can see that uh, the lives of farm workers are improving. The very same auditors who sometimes and mostly coming to companies are questioning workers when they raise critical issues. And that for us is a very critical problem that we are facing in the audited process. And when workers are complaining about their housing conditions or the working conditions or the health and safety, safety conditions in the workplace, these auditors are questioning workers like, you don't have a right to ask these questions. We can see that the farm owner is right. Everything is in place. And once they left the company, there is no report coming back to say, this is what we found wrong, this is what we found right, and that is what we're going to do further. And that is a problem because these audit processes are not, are not transparent at all. It's not transparent. Farm owners are taking some workers who are scared of him or her, in most predominantly uh, it's male owners, taking these vulnerable workers to the auditors and they must say for everything, yes, it's right, yes, it's right, while they are knowing that it's not right because they are scared of being victimized or intimidated by these uh, uh, farm owners or owners in, in, in the company. The other problem that we have, we farm, work, uh, farm owners are producing grapes to sellers, which we call the co-ops. In the BSEI code, it states very clear that the co-ops will make sure that the BSEI code will be implemented across all the supply chain. We are struggling for the past five years, uh, six years or more to get access to the farms who are supplying grapes, for example, to Robertson Winery, who are supplying grapes to Eston Winery, who are supplying grapes to Lewenkale, who are supplying grapes to Hood Constantia. Their argument is they have no right to intervene in these independent farmers. But these farmers are owners at the end of the day of the sellers who is producing the wine and the, those wine who's going overseas. The owners of these wines are the farmers because they are directors. They are owners on the, in the co-op. But when we argue to have access, we even go to the extent, and that is where transparency is being blocked. We ask uh, these seller companies 
that we must establish a joint ethical committee that will monitor the ethical codes which the companies is affiliated to. Up until today, not one of them have agreed. They say they have no right to intervene in independent farms while they are affiliated to the BSEI code, which states very clear that they will make sure that everything is in place. And the one thing is freedom of association. Even in the audited process, the auditors will tell workers, you have the right to join a union while the farm owner is there. When they left and they join a union, they are being dealt with severely. And many, many farm workers, millions have lost their houses being evicted illegally, being dismissed from farms because they have exercised this thing that they, they are so entrenched in the ethical codes which are called the freedom of association. And nothing happened to these farmers, nothing. The only response we got, we are going to get into dialogue with them to see if we can address the issue but the dialogue is not enough. Even if, if I could just imagine the beautiful things that is in place there in, on paper, in terms of the process that is being followed, the monitoring from, from the monopolies, I could just imagine how great this thing would be if it, if it just be implemented in practice, in reality, because it's a dream for, far, for farm workers. It's not in reality. The audited is not in reality for farm workers. It's not benefiting farm workers. It's only benefiting these uh, farm owners, like I said previously. And that is, the, that is the problem that we have. As long as we keep the auditing process a secret and use these auditors who are familiar with the companies who have built a relationship over the years, because they will come and they will sit in the office, they will drink wine, they will drink grape or getting boxes of, 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 of fruits when they're done doing the audit, how can you expect that, that will be, there will be transparency? When these auditors are sitting the whole day in the offices of the farmers or the offices of the sellers and drinking coffee and wine and getting out, taking boxes of wine and grapes and fruits and in the cars, there they go, issuing a certificate to the company. How can we say that there's transparency? And that is why it's very important what my comrade of rights, comrade Jasper, the right to know. Farm workers don't have that right to know. They don't even know what pesticides they are using. Farm women don't even know the dangers of the pesticides where they are forced to work while a tractor is spraying these pesticides near them or mostly when they're immediately done spraying, they are forced to go into the vineyards, forced to work with their bare hands in, with the pesticides. And we reported this several, several times and nothing, nothing happened to these farmers, nothing happened to these co-ops. And no one is trying to hold these co-ops and these farmer owners accountable for the human abuse that they are doing to our people day by day. Thank you. Thanks, Deniko. Thanks. Uh, Tom, uh, which Tom is it? Uh, Tom Heinrich, is it you raising your hand? Me, I think. Oh, some Hastings. Okay. Yes. We go. I think we're opening up to uh, the, the floor now as well. It's, uh, it's half past six. Uh, of, of, since we don't want to be here all night, I guess. But uh, welcome, uh, Tom Hastings, if you have a question or a comment on this. Yeah, no, thank you. And thanks to all the speakers. It's really uh, en enlivening. And um, a good end to the year to have this discussion for me, I think. Um, yeah, I'm very sad hearing some of the reflections, particularly after Bitter Grapes and having spoken with um, System Blaggett and Vin Monopoly and trying to get some sort of clarity on what their revised procedures would be. And also the revised procedures on Vita for trying to deliver on more rigorous, more transparent auditing. I wondered if, if Kasawu or other people on the ground here, could, is there any sort of reflection here on, on has there been any change since Bitter Grapes? And in particular, I know System Balagat, for example, I, I, I was in a meeting with them actually 
with Tisawu and, and Trevor and so on. And, they, and I know they went down a route of engaging with IUF, having a memorandum of standing, uh, a memorandum of understanding with IUF with a view to trying to be more strategic about how they put pressure on non-complying producers and also with a view to trying to coordinate trade union um, intervention there, I thought. Whereas Vin Monopoly, I was on the understanding that they had they had gone down a more sort of internal route of doing some of the, their own internal checks more. I wondered, how has this panned out on the ground? Has there been any difference between these two approaches? It sounds like it's a very negative picture. Has there been any progress? Has there been any different outcomes based on the two approaches of these two groups, for example? This is a, a question to, uh, uh, to Denico. Yes, thanks uh, for Tom for asking this, this very critical questions, uh, question. And I think uh, the only slightly change that you see is on the seller level, but not change on the farms. And that is what we still experience. In fact, after butter grapes, uh, I hope Tom is still here. After butter grapes, Many of Kasau members have been dismissed from the biggest farm supplier of Robertson Winery called Islandia. All those and many of those workers who, who spoke out during that process are today jobless and they are in a process to being evicted from the farms. So I would really like to say yes, but I cannot because the reality on the ground for us is on the farm level, nothing is changing. In fact, it is getting worse. The suppliers, the farm owners are threatening workers when they join trade unions. Workers are losing their jobs when they join trade unions. Women are forced to work in pesticides. Most men are not using protective clothing still if they're using pesticides on the tractors. So for us on the floor, nothing has changed except the beautiful changes which are explained to us on papers. But in reality, I can guarantee you nothing has changed. These people are, are being Farm workers are being exploited more and more after these better grades, after the interventions and all of these things. Vita have not come to the table. CISA have not come to the table. Global Gap have not come to the table. We don't have any progress report that can state that we see some changes here. Nothing. And that is for us a challenge that we we have we have these these agreements we have this understanding that we will work together which which is right and sometimes it's difficult for us to identify where these farmers grapes are going who is violating the rights of workers but there is slightly change on the seller levels that I can I can I, where where I am working every day I can see that workers are not mostly are not victimized when they join the trade union but on the farm level there is no freedom of association no freedom of association on the farms levels and in certain sellers is the very same like it is on the farm level as we speak now i have been attending a case where there were three women who were dismissed last year no in this year during the pandemic the farmer have tried to get means to get rid of them so that it, because they are affiliated to Kasau. And he dismissed six Kasau members in a space of four months. And we reported it to Vita, nothing happened. They are still investigating since last year, September, 2019. They didn't brought us any report on what they found with the company. And this company is called Dietlov's Wine Estate. 
This company was part of fair trade for many years. The workers didn't even know what is, what is fair trade, how is fair trade working. These people that is working for fair trade on the ground just come and give an overview of fair trade. There is no accountability or transparency in terms of the premium money of workers. And when workers join Kasau and ask the farmer, what happened to our premium money? He started to dismiss the workers right, left and center. And we are sitting currently with seven CCMA cases against this particular company. So it's a, it will be a totally light to us to say things have changed. Thanks, I hope I clarify it all. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Danico. Uh, we have uh, now three questions. Uh, maybe you try and keep it a little bit short, or both questions and answers uh, and comments. Uh, Jesper is uh, next, then Sophie, and then uh, Tive. Uh, Jesper. Thank you so much. Uh, it was about uh, the, um, the well, the two things. I I recognize fully the situation that um, audits ask questions to workers and workers are asked uh, if they are free to organize in trade unions. Uh, I was at a factory in the garment industry in Bangladesh and the workers told me that they had been asked that uh, 20 times or something and at last they, they asked more and more about what is a trade union <laughs> and in the final end they organized. I mean uh, of course there are employers who want to Get rid of workers who want to organize, but that's where that's where the um, the, the trade union, uh, its its federation at national level, must back uh, workers up and must uh, be able to put pressure on on the company. Uh, I, I think that if you want international support for those specific struggles, it's very it's very important that it's specific. It's very important that it's uh, documented. Uh, and and that it is not you know um, telling that everything is bad and it's getting worse and worse because then the capacity of the international network to react to such such an information is not as big as if it's a very specific case we want to uh, to solve. And the other thing I would say is that it also requires some capacity from the union to help workers with the right to know. If you're talking about pesticides, uh, there's an internationally recognized right to have these material safety data sheets. Uh, they follow the product from the producer, but very often the users won't allow workers to read them. But the union, could, what I've done in what I've participated in in Latin America was to help the unions develop their own information material for workers. So it's not difficult. And it's not difficult also because there are so many specialists like uh, Edward and others who can help workers to, uh, to uh, unions to give the right information to workers about pesticides and their effects and how to protect yourself against them. And I would say that often the problem is that the, the guy on the tractor or the guy spraying the pesticide, he might have the personal protective equipment, but all the others are unprotected and, and, and therefore all workers at farms where you use certain pesticides should have the right to know about uh, these things. It also goes for the uh, labor rights, of course, that they have the right to know. But just to mention two specific examples about how um, you at the union side could maybe improve capacity to, to assist the workers. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, yes, but sorry, I just missed uh, Tom Heinemann before. Uh, Tom, do you want to come in with a comment? Yes, please. Sorry. Um, Denico, thank you for clarifying that uh, I didn't succeed with my film, changing the system within. Um, but thanks anyway uh, for bringing this up. Um, the Islandia farm in particular, where I interviewed some of the workers there, they were actually fired. Denico was absolutely right about that. And um, this is a huge challenge for me as a filmmaker to interview people where I anonymize them, I change their voice, I change their face, and still the farmers uh, are able to uh, find them and sack them. It's terrible uh, and I feel bad about that. Um, that said, uh, I think that uh, Transparency in this issue also goes with uh, showing it and don't telling it. 
we have uh, talked about uh, fair trade recently. Um, fair trade farms do not uh, do not uh, say that you cannot use pesticides. For one, uh, fair trade uh, hires consultants that is actually employed by the company they are about to um, to investigate and audit. That we saw on on uh, uh, a farm called Van Loveren, who um, who was taking off the fair trade seal for half a year or so after the documentary was aired. But but still, I th I think that well transparency goes all the way and and uh, Vita does not like uh, Kasabu uh, to my point of view they have uh, internally discussed with Kasavu that Kasavu wants to make changes and Vita doesn't want to make changes basically that's the that's the battle between these two organizations I think that maybe Denico has a, a little broader view on this, but um, um, to my point of view, you should not rely on uh, on these uh, on this uh, Vita stamp. Um, that is my basic on this end of story. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, next is uh, Sophia. Are you there, Sophia? Yes, I'm here. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, mit min spørgsmål er en, re er en reaktion til det. Can you uh, ask in English, please? Yeah, sorry. Um, so my question is uh, in relation to the question you posed uh, to our um, um, speaker from the selling group uh, on uh, the hesitation on releasing the audit material and audit report. Uh, and while I understand where, where you're coming from, uh, I would suggest you considering to release uh, the report uh, still with uh, with the note saying that you are not the producer of this you cannot take full guarantee that this is actually the full picture and invite uh, trade unions uh, and other experts to uh, submit additional information uh, and to comment on the report uh, or Uh, build a, a system uh, whereby you invite uh, for submissions when you audit a company. So you could, uh, before uh, before developing uh, uh, and asking for audit reports, build a systematic way saying each year you have a, a, a few uh, products where you open up for sort of a consultation uh, on information. Uh, this could help uh, improve the power balance, which is very screwed, uh, and also have more transparency uh, and also be that additional source of information that, that you are saying you are inviting uh, others to share information. So to give you additional points of view. So instead of being hesitant about releasing it, why not say this is some part of the picture, we are inviting others to, to share more details and maybe build a built some calls for information uh, and, and a system around that. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sophia. Um, maybe you would like to, um, uh, Amina, to just respond to that before we go to TV, you or, or your colleague from, uh, from Selling Group. Yeah, um, we're of course very interested to hear all uh, the suggestions just to, uh, to give a little more um, yeah, uh, information around or a little bit more to the challenges that we have is that because we are um, because we don't very often have a direct re relationship with the producer, not only is it not our information very often to uh, to be able to share, it's uh, our, either our vendors or it is the producer itself. But now we're also actually facing uh, challenges from the uh, uh, from the standards themselves, like Amphori, where because of GDPR and this information probably needs to be anonymized. And then we come into the question of is it then useful? Um, so another 
uh, part could also be that uh, when transparency becomes uh, obligatory by law, for example, or we need to provide a link to the producer, um, then uh, this information or these questions can go straight to the producer. Um, but we definitely, of course, want to hear all the suggestions and want to see how these can be incorporated. Sorry, I'm unmuted. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mina. Um, it's Tiba next, and then Mersha. Uh, Tiba. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm also. Um, uh, we'll we'll ask this question specifically to uh, Mina and Deniko because I am curious uh, from Mina's side. Um, what a uh, selling group like with with uh, what you hear in this uh, conference today. Uh, specifically what you've heard from Edward and, and Deniko, um, what, what, you will, what you will bring back uh, for, for the next steps of selling group, uh, how you will engage with, the, with stakeholders in your wine production, like what, uh, with, for instance, with what you hear from Deniko, is, um, is there a possibility for, for, for uh, Casao and, and selling to be, um, to, to work on something together. So I'm, I'm curious, both uh, from Danico and from uh, Mina's side to hear what, uh, what are steps forward, what are steps forward for selling group and, and from Danico, does it make sense to engage with the companies like selling group? Thank you. Yeah, should I go first? I take it as yes, yeah. <laughs> um, I would just uh, like to bring an example and that was actually information that was brought to our intention by uh, 3F and, and Jesper in, in, uh, in a different forum around uh, uh, South uh, Spanish uh, fruit and vegetable producers where, um, where we heard uh, about issues in a similar uh, fashion where stakeholders from uh, from the industry where we're discussing what the problems are with, uh, with unionizing and so forth. And there, uh, because our information uh, did not reflect or what we could read from reports and what we could see from our own data did not uh, reflect uh, the same issues, we actually went and investigated. So we looked into our supply chains and we looked into the area, we talked to our uh, suppliers and we went and actually visited producers to see whether the issue uh, held. Um, and, and that was very, very useful and it could be something similar here. Uh, so we're absolutely not um, uh, excluding the possibility and, and that is very often how we work is that when we hear that there is something that our information, which is the audit reports, is not reflecting, but we hear that is actually happening on the ground, then we need to make sure that we fill the gaps. So that is something I could see um, that we will we will look more into definitely. Deniko, did you want to comment on that as well? Uh, thanks. And yeah, I I think that Gazao had made over the past years a set of demands to the monopolies, uh, especially in the Scandinavian countries. And one of the demands is that we want to be included into the auditing process of these companies, especially the farms and others, etc. We also we also want uh, to to have a joint monitoring committee where we can be resourced by the monopolies in order for us to also monitor the compliance of all the companies that is uh, selling their wines to these monopolies. That is, that, that is what we want. Monopolies must invest in the trade unions that is working on the ground on a daily basis because workers are more openly, are spoken more openly to us than they were speaking to strangers who's coming into companies or coming uh, on farms. And that is what we, that is what 
I believe that we must do is to is to is to get monopolies to to invest in trade unions so the trade unions can be able to capacitate themselves in order to report violations of any ethical standards that these uh, owners are compliant to and um, and that we we should seriously consider because Kasau will speak about this for the past years now and we didn't get it right to even be part of an audit Yeah, thanks. It's a, it's a very concrete thing where we, we should ask every um, stakeholder at every level is why aren't the trade unions part of the audits, uh, you know, fully participating that uh, we must, that is one question we must just always have on our, uh, on our agendas, I think. Uh, I just wanted to bring in uh, before Mersha has a comment. Um, oh, okay. Mersha, do you want to go now? Otherwise I had a, a question for, for Eddie. And oh, my, yeah. my point yes. is both to uh well uh, eddie can respond as well as the others but i think uh, one of the things that we have said consistently as kasau as tcoe etc is the fact that we must know the what the audits are about and i think we've made the point from the beginning that the audits are not simply about ensuring equity, et cetera. The audits are about um, capital auditing itself. So the bosses have set up a system that audits themselves so that they can sell wine. I think we must be clear about that. What is the purpose of the audit? And the audit has come about because there's been pressure from organizations uh, in the north, in the south, to demand ethical standards and so on. And so the audit has just uh, been, and I think the auditors in the group can talk to that, is about making sure the wines can sell better, more easily. And that is at the heart of the problem. Because I'm not sure that we should rely and can rely on capital to audit itself in a pro-worker, pro-union, independent, autonomous manner until we change this power relations, until we change the structure of auditing, et cetera. So I think that is something we, we need to, to really interrogate. The second point is the point that Jasper makes, and I want to pick up on it. So Kasau has done quite a lot, and we've won quite a lot in the field. This, um, for example, this um, study that Eddie's talking about, it's not an, a study that comes from nowhere. It is a study that comes from TC and the labor unions and organizations that works with TCOE because we have recognized and seen that without having a, a study, an autonomous, independent study compiled by an academic, et cetera, and I'm not even sure Eddie's going to make the grade uh, in terms of the standards of some of these uh, farmers and so on, um, but certainly, Kasau has done a large number of participatory action research activities where we've highlighted a range of, of problems with pesticides. I'm just using pesticides as an example, but it's not taken seriously. And hence, this commission so that we can begin to say, but we have evidence, we have uh, independent research that can show these things. I also think that uh, the role of Kasau in um, organizing stronger work committees, the levels of different advocacy, advocacy things, including the films of Tom, films of Johan and so on, has begun to put uh, agriculture and the wine sector slightly on its back foot. I think we need to do more of that. And a lot more must be done to have meetings like this where we can begin to win greater solidarity. Thanks.
thanks, Marcia. Um, I think it's uh, it's five to seven, so I think we need to round off uh, off very quickly. Uh, I just had a, a maybe a, a question also for Eddie. Are you still there, Eddie? It's been a while since we've heard from you. I can't see you. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. No, because we're, now we're talking about research, and I think Mersha made a lot of great points that are also pointing forward now from, because what's what's going to happen when we close down now in, in a few minutes? Uh, it shouldn't stop here, obviously. Um, because I, when I, I read, I just looked through your report uh, quickly, uh, and I think you mentioned it also in your in your introduction that the, the EU has, has, has this double standard, no surprise there for, for those of us who know a little bit about the EU, uh, how you say that the EU bans the use of hundreds of pesticides for use in European agriculture, but at the same time allows European chemical companies to produce hazardous active ingredients for sale on the world markets, especially in developing countries who make up the lion's share of the world markets in pesticides. It allows uh, countries outside of its boundaries, including South Africa, to produce fresh produce, produce with EU imports as long as the product pesticides maximum residue level is in line with its own health requirements. In this way, the EU exports and dumps the direct hazardous health and environmental impact of pesticides onto developing countries. On the other hand, banned substances in the EU find their way back into the EU via the export of fresh produce and wine from South Africa. That I think that points to me, it sounds like this is where, for example, a new due diligence legislation should come, uh, come to the fore if there is proper sanctions uh, against uh, co companies who, who are in breach with this, because obviously you are, you are not living up to any kind of uh, due diligence in the, in, the, in, the, in the labor chain or in the, in the, in the value chain if you are using uh, illegal pesticides as long as it's not within the EU. And, and I was just wondering with all this research, uh, Mersh also talked about why are these findings not discovered by audits? There's all this stuff that you have discovered, yet the audits say, no, this is fine, that is fine, everything is in line with the health and safety regulations, yet here is the research. So this, this should be made more uh, available. As Mersh just said, we need to have all the data and the, the figures uh, and as we've talked about, uh, South Africa is good with statistics, things can be found, the research can be made, uh, and then it needs to be shared uh, much more broadly. And I don't know, it, it, Eddie, if you want to come in on that. Yes, thank you so much. Look, I, I think I agree with uh, what Mersha is trying to say is that, um, in fact, the task of the exposing of the questions is really on us. Um, and I think what we really need to do is to have a focused um, campaign on the questions. Now, for example, it is possible to put things on, a, on the label of a bottle of wine. Now you take, for example, companies producing household chemicals and things were forced to label them and to detail the active ingredients in those chemicals. You can look at any chemical you have in your the house and even the color of the, the label will tell you the grade of the toxic level of it, that thing. So on a bottle of red wine, you have, so on a bottle of wine, you have this bottle contains sulfur, full stop. It doesn't tell you what else it contains. And that I think is, can be done through a consumer um, rights uh, campaign to have transparency in terms of what is actually in a bottle and what is coming back to the EU and is part of EU um, policy and, and legislation, um, for, an, for an example. So that does allow for a campaign on the rights of the consumer on, on that level um, as well. On the issue of measuring expectation, uh, Clean Clothes had a wonderful campaign some years back um, where they took a garment I was able to calculate the kind of value chain and the cost of the garment as it goes along the value chain. And I think the same thing can be done for a bottle of wine. But of course, that would be an independent campaign from uh, lobby um, organize, um, organizations. Um, I think Mersh is correct that we kind of, 
I'm skeptical about um, the reliance on, on audit. They are very power centered um, in terms of, of, of who controls them and who, who does them. Um, but I think there are moments where you can have certain exposures of an audit and whether we can have access to those or use legal means to fight for access to those. South Africa's law does allow for you to write to access to information. So I'm sure in the EU, you have something similar um, where you can demand access to those documents and, and those reports. But I think as Jesper and other comrades were talking, it is more a question of, of, of workers' power that uh, will shift some kind of auditing. And I think that at some point you could have localized ruptures where workers do come out and struggle and you can actually shift something. But um, that of course is kind of long, all kinds of, of, of things. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think I saw a suggestion somewhere that someone says maybe we should have a label in, in Denmark where it says this bottle contains substances which are banned from EU agriculture. <laughs> but uh, I doubt, I doubt we'll see something like that. <laughs> But uh, we, we need to round off, but this is, uh, this is not the end. Oh, they, we just have a viewpoint. I'm just gonna read that uh, if I can, yes, but, uh, or maybe not. Uh, but I think we will, we will continue with this kind of uh, meetings. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us uh, today. I think we have lots more to talk about. We did think maybe that two hours was a bit long, but now it feels a bit short. Uh, we really have many ideas we're going to follow up and, and we will contact you all again from uh, Global Action uh, and also try to uh, sum up some of these ideas and see where we can go next uh, with uh, increased uh, transparency, obviously uh, more follow-ups on, on pushing for human rights and actual due diligence in the, in the different, uh, at the different levels, also with the uh, EU due diligence legislation, uh, of course, uh, and international solidarity more broadly uh, with the global action and, the, and partners in, 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 in South Africa as it is now. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I think we'll uh, round off here and you can uh, check out uh, yourselves when you are ready uh, and you will hear from us again. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.